His name is Seng from Hong Kong. Because of you, he got away. Why you didn't tell me about the bridge? I did. No, you didn't. I did. No, you did not. I said, stop. I don't understand what you be saying. What? You see what I'm saying? If you want the girl back alive, listen and do not talk. The drop will be made tonight, 11 p.m. The amount will be $15 million. I would like one of my people to help. Well, let me assure you, Counsel, the FBI considers this a top priority. Mr. Chris, I am not an American. My daughter, she is not an American. I understand that, sir, but... He's already on the plane. I trust you will treat him with the same courtesy as you have shown me. I just got a call from the FBI. The 10-year-old daughter of a Chinese diplomat was kidnapped this morning. And they want you on the case. FBI on me? That's right. Yes! His name is Lee. And the director considers this a top priority. Who is Lee and what kind of assignment is that? I work alone. I don't want no partner, I don't need no partner, and I ain't gonna never have no partner. Did Kojak have a partner? Yeah, the fat guy. Well, he wasn't ever with him. Look, did Columbo have a partner? Now, it's your job to keep him out of sight and away from danger, you understand? Please tell me you speak English. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? This is an FBI operation, and I don't need any help from the LAPD or some Chungking cop. Take a picture. It's okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Nobody likes you. You came all the way over here for nothing. You ain't gonna be on the uh, Which boy? Oh, hell no. All of a sudden, you speaking English now, huh? A little. A little of my ass. You lied to me. Hey, what are you doing? You ain't the only one with quick hands, are you? Ah! Say, man, y'all seen a little Asian dude about this height with a steering wheel on his arm? Don't move! Go screw yourself. What you say? Agent Carter has been helping with my investigation. Me and Lee are taking care of the situation. We have everything under control. Why were you hiding? Man, what you talking about? I want to hide. You were hiding. Man, I bent down to tie my shoe and I looked up, you was gone. what I asked for. I do. I hope now you realize how serious I am. You have 29 minutes left. Y'all! Y'all! You sound like a karate movie, y'all! That was childish, man. Thank you, thank you. What the hell are you doing? Rush Hour Flying kicked its way onto the big screen on the 18th of September 1998 in the USA and made its way to the UK in early December. Costing in the region of $33 million, it went on to gross $245 million worldwide, making it a huge hit for New Line Cinema. The film was directed by Brett Ratner, who had started out his career directing music videos and moved into feature films with Money Talks, which also starred Chris Tucker. Despite its success, it was given mixed reviews, but with most leaning towards the positive. With it being very much in the body cop genre, it had drawn comparisons to Lethal Weapon, Red Heat, Black Rain and Showdown in Little Tokyo. Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert both praised the film, with Gene highlighting the strong script and Ebert enjoying Jackie's action sequences and Tucker for his comedic timing, and how they both formed an effective comedic duo. However, Variety called it a frankly formulaic but raucously entertaining action comedy. They criticised its editing, saying that it works against Chan by breaking up the flow of his frenzied physicality. Entertainment Weekly were less kind and gave the film a C-, and was critical of the buddy comedy, saying, The two characters barely even have a relationship. They are a union of demographics. The urban market meets the slapstick action market. Come 2002, when Jackie was promoting the tuxedo, he was interviewed by the LA Times, and said he didn't like the movie and still doesn't. I don't like the way I speak English, and I don't know what Chris Tucker is saying, Chan replies. The movie is exciting, audiences like it, so it's okay. But it's American style. More dialogue, more drama, and a little bit of fighting. If you see my Hong Kong movies, you know what happens. Bam, 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 always Jackie Chan style. Me, 10 minutes of fighting. Jackie loved working with Brett Ratner and became close friends with Chris Tucker and appreciated the success of the film, but it was clear the action was watered down for the US market. Thanks to the film's success, two sequels would follow with Rush Hour 2 in 2001 and Part 3 in 2007, which I will explore a bit later in the video. There was a TV series commissioned in 2016 for CBS, with Brett Ratner as the show's executive producer. 
John Fu and Justin Hyes would star as Detective Lee and Agent Carter for the CBS series, but the show was cancelled after one season despite having good viewing figures, but reviews were harsh, saying the leads had lacklustre chemistry and the show having an uninspired plot that failed to live up to the movie franchise. Chris Tucker, Jackie Chan and Brett Ratner have all discussed the possibility of a fourth entry in the series and has been long in development with not much moving forward and with Brett Ratner's sexual assault and harassment claims during the Me Too movement in 2017, his career as a director came to a standstill, but he is currently working on the Milli Vanilli movie. Director Brett Ratner was a massive fan of Jackie Chan and was thinking of ways to work with him, with Rumble in the Bronx proving a big hit for Jackie Chan in 1995. It opened the door for Jackie to get more work in the West. He was being offered many roles and was unsure what to pick to be his first English-speaking feature, as Rumble in the Bronx had been dubbed over. Jackie had tried to break into the English-speaking market back in the 1980s with The Protector and failed. So he returned to Hong Kong and continued working there and became this huge star. Fans of action cinema all over the world had been enjoying his films for years on the home video market, but the general public didn't really know of Jackie, and Brett Ratner wanted to change that. Brett had his chance to meet with Jackie to suggest a script, Rush Hour. Rush Hour began as a spec script written in 1995 by screenwriter Ross LaManna, which had been doing the rounds through the studios and ended up at New Line Cinema, who were willing to invest having done money talks with Ratner. The script itself would end up being changed quite a bit once it landed in Brett's lap. Brett wanted to put Jackie Chan in a buddy cop movie, not as a co-star or sidekick, but on equal footing with an American star with Martin Lawrence in mind for Agent Carter. Ratner flew out to South Africa where Chan was filming Who Am I? and pitched the film, not knowing Jackie had already read the script to Rush Hour and he also felt it was the best one for him. Brett gave him a copy of Money Talks to show Jackie that he was serious and knew what he was doing as a director. Jackie said Money Talks felt like a real movie, with a beginning, middle and an end, with great characters and a great storyline. He told Brett that Hong Kong directors don't understand story and only understand action, but Brett knew both and agreed to make Rush Hour. Ratner convinced Jackie to speak English, which he was very apprehensive about, and to avoid any dubbing, as it would lend to the authenticity of his character. Martin Lawrence was no longer being considered for the part, and Brett knew Chris Tucker would be ideal. Chris Hadley took the part and wanted to play something different than he did in Money Talks, as he wanted to play a character that had more depth and could bring some real acting to his performance, and drew inspiration from Eddie Murphy as Axel Foley in Beverly Hills Cop. For the cast we of course have Jackie Chan as Detective Inspector Lee. Once Rumble in the Bronx was a hit, Miramax licensed some of Jackie's older movies to be re-released with Jackie's own voice dubbed over, and a lot of the Chinese humour removed. This didn't go down well with the fanbase, but catered for the new fans who were craving new content, and once Rush Hour was a hit, he would have a career boost with a new slate of movies following a similar formula, with Jackie teaming up with an American actor. Chris Tucker plays Detective James Carter, a role originally considered for Eddie Murphy, Wesley Snipes, Martin Lawrence and even Chris Farley. Some reports connected Farley not making this movie due to his tragic death in December 1997, which was not the case, as it had been decided a few years earlier that he was not going to be involved, as they were already leaning towards the two leads, one Asian and one black actor. Chris Tucker started out his career as a stand-up comedian. He made the move to feature films starring in House Party 3, Friday, Dead Presidents, The Fifth Element, Money Talks and Jackie Brown. Chris was a big fan of Michael Jackson and would do impressions of him in his stand-up performances. Come rush hour, he had his moments to show his love for the singer and the sequels would play on that. Him and MJ became close friends during the height of Tucker's career and he would appear in the music video for You Rock My World in 2001, around the same time as Rush Hour 2 was hitting cinemas. Chris would talk about their friendship in a fairly recent Netflix stand-up special. Chris knew he had to work out and get into shape for Rush Hour to not embarrass himself in front of Jackie Chan and his stunt team when it came to the fight sequences. Ty Ma plays Ambassador Han, a familiar face of US TV shows and has appeared in many big movies such as Dante's Peak, Arrival, Mulan and action classics such as Robocop 2 and Rapid Fire with the late Brandon Lee. He would return to the series in Rush Hour 3. Tom Wilkinson plays Thomas Griffin, aka Juntao. Griffin is a British diplomat and is secretly the top crime lord in Hong Kong. Tom was a star of UK TV and appeared in movies such as The Ghost in the Darkness before appearing in the smash hit The Full Monty. And to comic book fans, you will know him from Batman Begins. Ken Leong plays Zhang, Juntao's second in command. 
Ken's career has mainly focused on TV, appearing in the hit shows Lost and The Sopranos, but also made appearances in X-Men 3 and Star Wars The Force Awakens. The late Elizabeth Pena, a familiar face of US TV, plays as Detective Tanya Johnson, Carter's friend in the LAPD and aspiring bomb squad technician. Mark Ralston plays Special Agent Warren Russ of the FBI. Everyone should know Mark from Aliens and other popular movies such as The Shawshank Redemption, Eraser and The Departed. Rex Lynn plays FBI agent Dan Whitney. Rex was a familiar face of 90s action cinema, starring in Cliffhanger, Wyatt Earp, Drop Zone, Cutthroat Island and The Long Kiss Goodnight. The late Chris Penn plays Clive Codd, who deals with explosives. Chris has appeared in many classics such as Footloose, Best of the Best, Reservoir Dogs, True Romance and the guilty pleasure Turkey that is the live action Fist of the North Star. And finally, we have the veteran actor Philip Baker Hall as the captain of the LAPD. Philip has been working on TV since the early 70s and made appearances in movies such as Boogie Nights, Air Force One, The Truman Show, Bruce Almighty and The Zodiac. Filming would start in April of 1997 with the production shooting in and around California. For Consul Hahn's residence, they made use of the mansion featured in the Batman 60s TV show. Jackie said the scene when Lee meets Carter was very similar to the first time the actors met in real life. Chan said Tucker was talking so fast that after the meeting ended, Chan looked to his manager and said, I don't understand any of the words coming out of his mouth, a line that would be used in a film at Tucker's request. Chris Tucker would improvise a lot of his dialogue, often when arguing with someone or grilling them for information. In some cases, it made it tough to edit the dialogue into a coherent conversation, but it helped elevate the comedy, but it also made it difficult for Jackie. He would get sleepless nights when he knew he had a lot of dialogue to film the following day. He had to remember his lines, but also understand what Chris Tucker was saying. But with Chris changing the dialogue on the fly, it made it difficult for Jackie to react and concentrate on what he needed to say. Brett convinced the studio to let Jackie bring over his stunt team from Hong Kong, who would collaborate with the US stunt coordinator, Terry Leonard, who had worked on films such as Raiders of the Lost Ark, Die Hard 3 and The Fugitive. Terry would try to simplify the action sequences, as the production didn't have the flexibility of time that Jackie was so used to, and Terry had to control the safety on set. Insurance-wise, they couldn't take the risk of Jackie getting hurt. In Hong Kong, if Jackie got hurt, they would shut the picture down and return to filming once he was better. But that wasn't possible with this production. They had a safety captain on set to keep an eye on Jackie. It did help Jackie feel more relaxed and comfortable though when it came to doing his own stunts. The cast appreciated Brett Ratner's style of directing. He gave people loads of advice, helped them through their scenes, not hiding behind a monitor, assisting with the dialogue, especially for Jackie, to make sure he got the delivery of his lines correct. Brett was also full of energy which helped keep the spirits up on set. After filming and editing was completed, they had a screen test and the audience demanded more Jackie Chan action scenes. The crew went back to film for a few days and added in the scene where Jackie fights multiple bad guys during the closing confrontation, which involved trying to save a giant vase. Strangely, Rush Hour would inspire the creation of the website Rotten Tomatoes. The site founder was a big Jackie Chan fan and built the website to collect reviews of all of Jackie's Hong Kong films as they were being released in the United States. The site was coded and created in two weeks and went live before the release of Rush Hour. Rotten Tomatoes is now one of the most popular movie review websites and it's used as a quick way to judge a film's success. The film opens in Hong Kong on the last day of British rule in 1997. Detective Inspector Lee leads a raid hoping to arrest the unidentified crime lord Jun Tao. He only finds Zhang, Jun Tao's right-hand man, who narrowly escapes in a boat. Lee recovers numerous Chinese treasures, which were stolen by the crime lord, which he presents as a farewell victory gift to his departing superiors, Chinese Consul Han and the head of the British police, Thomas Griffin. Shortly after Han takes up his new diplomatic post in LA, his daughter Su Young is kidnapped by Zhang. The FBI don't want the Chinese involved and feel they can handle the situation by themselves, but Han insists on bringing over Lee, who is already flying over. The FBI decide to get the LAPD involved to keep Lee busy. Detective Carter is in trouble for his recent bust, getting two police officers hurt. And his captain, instead of suspending him, tricks him into thinking he's going to work for the FBI, but instead left to babysit Lee. Carter reluctantly takes Lee on a sightseeing tour, 
keeping him away from the embassy while doing his own investigating. Lee gets fed up with Carter and knows what he is doing and makes his way to the Chinese consulate, fighting his way through the boneheaded security team. Carter turns up late and starts arguing with the FBI team in charge and unwittingly negotiates with Zhang as he picks up the phone, arranging a $50 million ransom drop. The FBI traces the call to a warehouse where a team are sent in but killed by plastic explosives. Lee spots Zhang nearby and he and Carter give chase but Zhang escapes, dropping the detonator. Carter speaks to bomb expert Johnson about the detonator and traces it to Clive he arrested earlier and his dealings with C4. Lee presses Clive and he reveals a location, a restaurant in Chinatown. Carter goes to the restaurant alone and sees a surveillance video of a man he hasn't seen before carrying Sue Young into a van. Carter is about to get killed by Zhang's gang and Lee arrives and saves Carter just in time. The FBI turn up and blame them for the botched ransom drop, ordering Lee to be sent back to Hong Kong. Carter doesn't want to give up and persuades Lee to help save the child and enlist Johnson to help, and they prepare for a showdown at the grand opening of the Chinese art exhibition, overseen by Han and Griffin. The score to Rush Hour would be handled by veteran composer Lalo Schifrin, with it being recorded at the 20th Century Fox Studios in Hollywood. The composer is best known for his work on the Mission Impossible TV series Bullet, Dirty Harry and of course Enter the Dragon. Brett Ratner was a big fan of Lalo Schifrin, having used him on his previous feature Money Talks and Enter the Dragon was one of his favourite movies of all time. Brett asked Lalo to write the Enter the Dragon of the 1990s and with a full symphonic score. He was told to ignore the comedy and focused in music on the drama, the danger, the suspense, the action and the adventure. Lalo thought it was an interesting idea and felt it was the right way to go. The film had a pop music thrown in to play on the comedic moments. The score came to CD a month or so after the film's release. The Def Jam soundtrack for the film arrived when the film hit cinemas. That album was a mix of R&B and hip hop and samples of dialogue were included from the film between each track. The soundtrack was a huge success and spawned the number one single How Deep Is Your Love. Though not all the songs featured in the film appear on the album, such as War by Edwin Starr. There was music videos produced a time with the movie and they would find themselves later on the DVD and Blu-ray. I love the score to Rush Hour. Of course, it very much leans on the style Lalo did for Enter the Dragon. In some parts of the score, there are cues that feel somewhat lifted from the 70s classic, and it doesn't bother me in the slightest, because I as well love that score, and taking cues from that was an inspired choice. The whole score by Schifrin is calling upon his earlier work, even outside of the Bruce Lee movie, to bring to the table, which I really appreciated at the time. As film music was pushing towards more of the Hans Zimmer style, this felt like it was going back to the classics, which put a big smile on my face. Outside of the action and dramatic musical cues, Lalo really excels at the slower moments, especially Su Young's theme, which starts with this traditional Asian motif that builds into this big emotional moment. It works a treat. A highly recommended score if you can find it for an affordable price. Before I get to my final thoughts on the film, let's have a quick chat about its sequels. Rush Hour 2 hit cinemas in the summer of 2001 and it was a massive success, earning nearly double what the original film did. Carter goes to Hong Kong to have a well-deserved break, but gets caught up in a counterfeit conspiracy with the Chinese triads that finds Lee and Carter going back to the United States and they wind up in Las Vegas. The reviews were mixed again, but I had a blast watching this at the time and still enjoy going back to it today. The story isn't really that exciting, dealing with counterfeit money is nothing original, but they have great villains for Tucker and Chan to face up against, with John Lone and Zhong Zi. The sequel really plays up Tucker's manic style. A lot of girly screaming, fast talking again and throwing insults left, right and centre. He is brilliant, but I think they amped him up too much. He is played to be more of a dummy in the sequel, where in the original he had a bit of brains on his shoulders, and he is underestimated by the FBI and his fellow police officers. Jackie coasts through it and provides a bit more crazy stunts. Weirdly, Rush Hour 2 never came to Blu-ray in the UK, and is only available in a box set from the USA and Germany, from what I could find online. The film was probably the finest finale of the series with Tucker using the greatest line of dialogue before the bomb goes off as they jump out the window at the last second.
There was a six year gap until Rush Hour 3 arrived, with Tucker getting the biggest payday for an actor at the time, at $25 million, which is crazy considering he hadn't acted for a number of years. It just demonstrated he knew that the film couldn't be made without him, and he got what he wanted. But the third film had arrived too late. I'd like you to meet our dates for this evening, Marsha and Zoe. That one's yours. Jackie Chan's success at the US box office had started to fail a couple of years earlier with some clunky action comedies like The Tuxedo and The Medallion. The film has to pair tracking an assassin to Paris to unravel a mystery about the Chinese triads, with some of the cast from Rush Hour 1 returning, with a massive budget of $140 million. It did well at the box office, earning $258 million worldwide, but the profit margins were far less than their previous entries, and being banned in China didn't help, and the reviews were mostly negative. But I didn't mind the movie, it had a bit more story to it compared to part 2, but the comedy doesn't always hit. Chris Tucker fires off some funny lines here and there. Lee, I got a big problem man. This boy's on steroids, he got a head like Barry Bonds. Oh, no. But a number of the gags just fall flat and felt repetitive. Jackie thankfully seemed to have more to do and a change of location was needed, but it showed that the Rush Hour series had become tired and formulaic, even for the body cop genre. I saw Rush Hour when it came to UK cinemas. I was really excited to watch it. As I've explored in my other reviews on Jackie Chan films, I was already a big fan, having grown up during the 90s watching Police Story, Operation Condor, City Hunter, and around that time, Rumble in the Bronx just hit VHS, which gave him this breakthrough into the US market as highlighted earlier. Now in his 40s, he was finally getting that attention from the general public, and not just having a dedicated following with the action genre crowd, who had been enjoying his movies for years on home video. Due to the movie arriving first in the USA on videotape, my friend actually got me a copy way before it came out in the UK. So I was excited to watch it at home, and later I would get the DTS Laserdisc, which I still have in my collection. I knew of Chris Tucker at the time, having watched Friday and The Fifth Element countless times, and I always enjoyed watching him. But it was a strange combo for Jackie teaming up with Chris, but the marketing of the film really highlighted what made it work so well. A week after the film's release in the USA, Jackie Chan's close friend Sammo Hung would star in the TV series Martial Law, which follows a similar premise, which was popular, but only lasted two seasons, I believe, due to its cost. It demonstrated, though, that filmmakers saw the potential of having the East meet the West in a buddy cop scenario. The film's story is really nothing new, however. We had seen the buddy cop genre be oversaturated the past decade, and at the time, just three months earlier, Lethal Weapon 4 had come out. But what made Rush Hour unique was that it took advantage of the lead actors and their skill set. Jackie, a first-rate martial artist, stunt performer and comedian, and Chris Tucker's fast-talking style and skill to improvise and deliver funny dialogue other than what's on the page gave the movie an extra bang for its buck. When it came to Jackie's new American feature films, we got to see him doing his usual stunts and fight sequences, but as a fan, it was like watching the light version of Jackie, the Diet Coke version, if you will. It wasn't too crazy like his earlier stuff, or even his current output for the Hong Kong market, and the fight scenes wouldn't go on for that long. You are working within the Hollywood system, and that never accommodates the time for lengthy preparation for elaborate fight scenes, but Rush Hour does have some enjoyable punch-ups, and the editing is done well. They are cutting after he makes an impact and not before. So we get to see everything, and it's shot and framed with wide angles. As Jackie has nothing to hide, he can do it all with ease. Chris Tucker, I would say, delivers a similar performance to what he did in Money Talks from the year before, but adds a bit more confidence and class to his character. Even though it's sold as equal billing with Chan and Tucker, the story lends itself more to Tucker's character and his journey. We are informed early on that Carter doesn't work well with others and doesn't need a partner and likes to break the rules to get the job done. He catches the bad guys but causes a lot of problems along the way and tries to charm his way out of things. Then he is forced to work with Lee, who is very much the opposite in how they work. He sticks to the rules, he is polite, professional and calm. When it comes to them trying to relate to one another and having Lee show Carter how to do some martial arts and take a weapon from the enemy and Carter trying to teach Lee how to sing and be cool in his eyes, this is the main selling point of the film. I don't re-watch Rush Hour and its sequels for the action. I return to them because of Tucker and Chan's chemistry, and the first film is really where it shines. Two guys with completely different backgrounds and ways of thinking try to get along and become close friends. And those moments of them just hanging out and even just arguing with each other is what makes it special. They both learn from each other, with Lee following the rules and accepting his failure to catch Zhang. 
It's Carter who persuades him to not listen to their superiors and regroup and to save the child themselves. For Lee's journey, it's for him to trust in his instincts and not just follow the rules. And for Carter, he learns to work well with others. The film is over 20 years old now and a lot has changed, especially with comedy in the mainstream media. People get offended easily nowadays and some may find the jokes in the film to be in bad taste. It uses stereotyping and generic racist gags and put downs as Lee and Carter get frustrated with each other. Most of these jokes are given to Tucker to say as he loses his temper or just fires back insults. It's executed in a way not to be taken seriously though. It's all done in a somewhat light-hearted manner for laughs. Come part two, they will play on that a bit more and rush hour three, they sort of dial it back a bit. But the use of stereotyping is the backbone of how the comedy is executed. It's all down to personal taste and if you find that funny or not. When it comes to the villains of Rush Hour, they are a bit underwhelming. The movie plays on the idea that Zhang is a mean piece of work and shows that he is in control and behind the ransom demands. But it's a switcheroo to reveal Jun Tao, who is the mastermind behind it all. Zhang doesn't come across as someone who could take on Lee and often appears a bit of a clumsy goof. He gets hurt by Su Young failing to kidnap her so his gang finishes the job and when fleeing from Lee after the explosion, he is just panicking and loses his footing. You think they would write a worthy adversary for Lee so he can fight one on one to showcase more of Jackie's skills, but Zhang is used later to fight up against Carter, who outsmarts him. Griffin, wonderfully played by Tom Wilkinson, who is good in pretty much everything, he doesn't quite have the bad guy threat to him, however. In traditional bad guy fashion, he tells everyone what he has been doing and what his plan is. It's the classic bad guy trope you find in the majority of James Bond films. I think come the sequels they were aware of that and would write the villains for Carter and Lee to face up against who were a bit more of a challenge to take down. Rush Hour is still a lot of fun to watch and still demonstrates the magic of pairing these two actors together. Brett Ratner has a great visual eye and does a wonderful job with the cinema scope format and he can shoot action very well. It's a shame Chris Tucker didn't really continue with much outside of the Rush Hour series due to his own decisions being very picky on what he wanted to do and I do wish Jackie was given the time and freedom to really show off his talents though. But I think Rush Hour's main goal was a way to open the door for Jackie and give general moviegoers a proper chance to see him on the big screen doing stuff that not many people can do. It's unfortunate it took so long for Hollywood to finally appreciate Jackie Chan, but I'm glad we finally got there. But perhaps it was a little too late in his career as he was in his mid 40s by this point to fully take advantage of the Western market on the big screen. Let me show your goofy ass how to do this. How long this flight? 15 hours. 15 hours? If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and click the bell to be notified of my latest retrospectives and reviews. Big thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel. If you want to get involved and gain early access to my content and exclusive videos, then follow the link below. Thank you.